Welcome back. At issue today, teens as activists. Some of you are choosing to help overseas. Others see lots of projects in Canada to get involved with. But the Me to We Foundation doesn't see volunteering here or abroad as an either or decision. In fact, they believe helping out at home, in your neighborhood, city, country, and even overseas are all connected. And they're looking for recruits. Check it out. to clean water. The public in Darfur has left 2.5 million people displaced and hundreds of thousands dead. The no world's population is living in unsanitary conditions leading to death and disease according to a UN-backed report. And joining me in the studio is 17-year-old J.P. Sachs from the Me To We Foundation. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Explain this philosophy to me that you don't have to choose to go overseas or Canada when you want to volunteer and help out. What I, th what I think Me To We is trying to go about is creating not only um, a change overseas by going and building schools and creating education, but also creating the change here and creating the generation that will make that change. So working to raise awareness here to help you know, at your local homeless shelter or food bank. And that there's really that interconnectedness between changing the way we think about global community and local community. And how did you first get involved in Me2We? I got involved through the school. Oh, okay. And at my school, like a lot of schools across Canada, um, Me2We has become a figment of what school life is like. Really? So there was a trip offered uh, to go to Kenya with the organization. Uh and I jumped on the opportunity. Went Why? To, Why is that something I want to go to Kenya that you're interested I in? I think just being a, a curious guy, this was before I knew much about the organization. I went to the We Day, the Meet a We Day, which is something uh, every year that the organization runs, which is kind of like a, a concert for social change. And there are speakers like this year, Ellie Wiesel spoke in Toronto, uh, the Jonas Brothers played in Toronto, in Vancouver, uh, the Dalai Lama spoke. You're kidding. Wow. Uh, as well as Jason Mraz played. Wow. So I went to that a couple years ago. Before it was as big as it is now. Now it's in the ACC. Then it was in the Rico Coliseum. And there were 8,000 students there. And I was inspired by it. Wow. And took the opportunity to go on the trip. And since then, I've been trying to do everything I can to be as involved as possible. Now, Craig Kielberger, who is known to many Canadians as a very young uh, motivated person for social change. This is an organization he founded, is that correct? It is. It started with Free the Children, which he founded when he was 12 years old. Got up in front of his, you know, his class and said, who will join me? And it started as 12, or a small amount of 12-year-olds, right. 12, 12-year-olds. 12, 12 year olds. Right. And then from there, it's become the largest network of children helping children around the world through education. And from that, Free the Children, uh, was the international aid organization. Right. But Me to We, which he founded later, became more focused on changing our mindsets. So as I said, to create those kids that make that change overseas. More, more people like him. Exactly. I'm looking at your shirt. What exactly, do, what does it say and what does it mean? It says, we are the mob, we are the masses, we are the movement. Right. Uh, the mob is, an, is a, a campaign I'm a part of. This is called Mobilizers. The Mobilizers. Which I think we saw, Mobilizers, which you saw sort of a yes. little clip of. What, what is that about? So the Mobilizers are the, the advocates of the me to we philosophy, you know, the me to we way of life. And there are mobs, the Mobilizers, the mob, in all, basically all the major cities across Canada. And what we do is we, we spread that message of social change. We mobilize the people around us. So by talking about 
you know, what it is to live we, what it is to think with the global consciousness, consciousness and think about community. And we spread that message through awareness campaigns, through fundraising campaigns, and try to create that change here that eventually creates that change overseas. And to give me a f more examples maybe of what the kind of stuff you did you do have done in Canada. You mentioned sort of volunteering at a food bank or stuff like what kind of work volunteer you it it goes from a scale of awareness raising to also raising money. Uh, and sometimes the two will go hand in hand. So there are campaigns like Halloween for Hunger where we encourage youth to instead of asking for candy when they go trick-or-treating to ask for non-perishable food items and bring it to their local food bank. Or helping out, as I said, a homeless shelter when we go and you know, 15 of us will go and make beds or hand out food. Or when we'll go to Dundas Square in Toronto and we'll hold up signs that say free hugs and just spread that happiness. It can be the littlest of things to larger things like going overseas and helping in India. And speaking of going overseas, I want to take a look at your trip to India. We have a clip of that. Let's take a look at that now and then we'll be right back. I got the opportunity to sign up for this trip. There was no question about it. The best week of my life. It's really beautiful to see what the world's like after you've seen more of it. Hearing the sounds, the smells, I'd never experienced anything like it before. Having fun with your friends, having fun with the group that you're with, having fun with people that you never met before. It's nothing like what would happen if you were to send money over to a country like this because not only are you helping by building a school and interacting with the people of the rural communities. It shows that we actually do care and we do know that they are over there and that we are trying and doing our best to help. Even though we were working in the blistering heat and chopping these huge rocks and hauling sand and stuff. It was all so much fun because we knew that we were doing it for such an amazing cause and we got to work with some local people from India which was really great and even though there was such a language barrier, it didn't really matter because it was just the fact that we were working together that was really great. We would play with the children, that was such a highlight. When they showed us their games, there was no boundaries, we were just all playing together. You're setting a foundation for hundreds of children's education and you know it's just a ripple effect that's never going to stop. Experiencing the different cultures definitely broadens your mind to the different lifestyles of people around the world and it opens your mind to world issues as well. It changes you so much and you realize that half of the part of the trip is your personal change. You come back from anywhere and your perspective has changed but when you go to India and you see the extreme poverty and the extreme contrast from what they have to what we have, it's a, it's a shock. But they have the hugest smiles and you see how honestly happy they are to be alive, to be going to school and living. You realize that life is what matters, happiness is what matters and it's, it's not the things you can buy. Thank you, India, for giving that to me because it's not like you could ask for a better gift, really. The outlook that I have on my life now is just so different now that I've been to India. The trips are completely amazing. They're life-changing, incredible and impactful, and you will never forget them. You don't need to be the most popular kid. You don't need to be the richest kid. You need to be the kid that wants the difference and wants to change, and anybody can be that kid. You mentioned to Patrick that uh, your trip doesn't start till you get back. What did you mean by that? Well, there's sort of an idea that the purpose of your trip is to inspire you and to give you those stories because it becomes not just, you know, I'm raising money to help kids in Africa or to help kids in India or Ecuador or any of the countries that Free the Children works in, but, you know, I am doing this to help, you know, that boy that I met in that village or that girl that I held hands with and played with. So when you get back by sharing those stories and by sharing those experiences, you can become sort of the spreader of that change. And it inspires you to do everything you can or what you know you can. Because there are people who will say, of course, that well, going to India for two weeks doesn't accomplish anything. How, I mean, how would you respond to that? My response to that is when we go there, I, you know, we were building a health center in India. And people will tell me, you know, JP, 
you're not a construction <laughs> worker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, how are you building a health center? And my answer to that, and the way I think about it, it, it is not so much the fact that I'm throwing a pickaxe into the ground, mm. but more the statement I'm making mm. by throwing that pickaxe to the ground, both to the people back home and to the people in that community to show them that you know, Canadians from the other side of the world care enough to come over there mm. and show them that care. And then to talk about it when you come back. And to talk about it when we get back. I want to ask you a bit about your trip. You said okay. you turned away beggars in India. Why do you turn away beggars when people coming up to you looking for money? There is a, um, a philosophy that we have as an NGO in another mm. country that we are a hand up, not a hand out. Mm. And the, we don't want to have the image of just the NGO that comes in and hands out coins to kids on the street. Right. Also, it is very hard and heartbreaking when a seven-year-old boy comes up to you and asks yeah, for money I mean, how do you ask for food. How does that affect you? You can't what I would, him. What I would do, what some of us would do to sort of ease the pain on ourselves and sort of give them some sort of interaction and give them a happiness, is I would, I would get down on my knees to talk to them and I would ask their names in Hindi, which is Apkia Namhe. And they would tell me their names and then I would intentionally get them wrong. So I'd call, <laughs> I'd call the boys the girls, and the girls the boys, and then they'd laugh. Right. And then they'd try and say my name, and it was having that interaction. Right. Which is, for them, I think, maybe just important, that moment of hope, then, right. you know, five rupees. There was one particular story when this happened, and um, a boy named Praveen started, after I talked to them and I left, he started following me through the market. And he came up beside me and was grabbing onto my pants. But he wasn't asking for anything anymore. He wasn't asking mm -hmm. me for money or asking for food. He just, I don't know what he wanted. But eventually I, I held his hand. And we were walking through the market together for almost half an hour, just walking hand in hand. And I'd look over at him and he'd laugh and he'd give me this big smile. And then we'd run and we'd slow down and just sharing that joy. And I can't help but wondering, I can't help but be wondering, is this boy walking away from anything? Is he walking to anything? Does anyone wonder where he is? And the reality is it's probably not because he's probably one of the children that you know, we read about, one of those millions of kids that doesn't get to go to school who is in child labor. Uh, when we got back to the bus, I asked someone to, to translate for me to him, that, uh, to tell him I would remember him because obviously it was hard to get on the bus mm -hmm. and for him not to. And I was told that uh, not to worry about it because he was just a beggar and mm -hmm. I should get on the bus and enjoy the air conditioning. And it was moments like that where to share that reality with that seven-year-old boy that his community is telling him, his world is telling him that he's nothing but a beggar. And anyone who has had a seven-year-old child before knows that there's a lot more to a kid of that age than just a beggar and that the fact that that should be their reality is mm. totally unjust. And that, those are the things that inspire me. Mm that inspire me to keep doing what I'm doing and living the way I am. So you that's seem very wise important. for your years. <laughs> if someone is watching right now and is inspired, what can they do? How can they find out more about Midui? Well, they can either go to the website at midui.com or freethechildren.com and learn more about what is going on. Or it can be as simple as you know, smiling at someone on the street, holding mm. a door open, or just living with not so much thinking about how things benefit you, how things benefit me, but how things benefit we which is the whole philosophy, not that you're competing with the people around you, but you're working together. And that just like we share with our friends that idea that we are one because we have things in common, but thinking about everyone you meet is someone that you have something in common with because you're fellow human beings, whether they're on the streets of Toronto or whether they're living in the slums of India. Because a great place to stop. Thank you very much for coming in today. All right, thank you. Appreciate your thank time. you for having me. Well, that's it for this edition of Ad Issue for Teens. You can go to our website, iChannel.ca, to watch this entire show online. Just click on Video on Demand and Ad Issue for Teens. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook and email your thoughts to comments at iChannel.ca. I'm Kevin O'Keefe. Thanks for watching.